Good morning, everybody. This is our final set of readings from Midsummer Night's Dream, Act 5. We're starting at Act 5, Scene 1. Uh, in fact, there's only one whole scene um, through right to the end. So we'll do three readings, which I will do consecutively for you. So you, that might help you to get some uh, idea of uh, how, this, how the scene runs. Obviously, this is the play within the play, what we call in French the mise en abîme. So we are spectators watching the play of Midsummer Night's Dream, watching the nobles and the lovers, watching the play of the mechanicals who are playing uh, Pyramus and Thisbe, which is very akin to Romeo and Juliet. So Shakespeare's having a bit of fun here, making reference to one of the plays that actually he took um, from Ovid. So um, here we really do have several plays within the plays within the plays within the plays. So it's like looking into the Bashkiri. Uh, you know, the Vashkiri has um, earrings which are made out of boxes of Vashkiri, on which there is a box with the Vashkiri and da, 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 da. the other um, idea of Mise en Abîme, very much used by Andy Warhol, um, was the television looking at a television, looking at a television, looking at a television. So that's what we mean by Mise en Abîme, or the play within the play. OK, so let's start um, with uh, Act 5, Scene 1. Hippolyta and Theseus are getting ready to enjoy the play. Um, and uh, we hear the discussion here with here's Shakespeare talking about his own craft of uh, being a playwright and writing plays and performing them of course so Hippolyta tis strange my Theseus what these lovers speak of Theseus more strange than true I never be believe these antique fables nor these fairy toys lovers and madmen have such seething brains such shaping fantasies uh, that a friend more than cool reason ever comprehends the lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. One sees more devils than vast hell can hold. That is the madman. The lover, all as frantic, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. The poet's eye, in a fine frenzy rolling, doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. And as imagination bodies force the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Such, tr such tricks have a strong imagination that if it would apprehend such joy, it comprehends such some bringer of that joy. Or, in the night, imagining some fear, how easy is a bush supposed to bear? Hippolyta. But all the story of the night told over, and all their minds transfigured so together, more witnesseth than fa fancies images, and grows to something of great consistency, but howsoever strange and admirable. Enter the lovers. Theseus. Here come the lovers full of joy and mirth. Joy, gentle friends. Joy and fresh days of love accompany your hearts. Lysander, more than are to us, wait in your royal walks, your board, your bed. Theseus, come now. What masks, what dances shall we have to wear away this long age of three hours between our after supper and bedtime? Where is our usual manager of mirth? What revels are in hand? Is there no play to ease the anguish of a torturing hour? Poor Philostrate, Philostrate, here, mighty Theseus. Theseus, say what abridgment have you for this evening? What mask, what music? How shall we beguile the lazy time, if not with some delight? Philostrate, there is a brief how many sports are ripe. Make choice of which your highness will see first. Theseus reads, the battle with the senators to be sung by an, an Athenian eunuch to the harp. Will none of that. That I have told my love in glory of my kinsman Hercules. Reads the riot of the tipsy bacchanals, tearing the Thracian singer in their rage. That is an old device, and it was played when Phi from Thebes came last to conquer her. Reads the thrice the muses mourning for the death of learning late deceased in beggary. That is some satire keen and critical, not sorting with a nuptial ceremony. Reads a tedious brief scene of young Pyramus and his love of Thisbe. <laughs> Tedious and brief? That is hot ice and wondrous strange snow. How shall we find the concord of this discord? Uh, I think we stop around there. No, we don't. A play there is, my lord, some ten words long, which is as brief as I have known a play. But by ten words, my lord, it is too long, which makes it tedious. For all in the play, there is not word one, one word apt, one player fitted. And tragical, my noble lord, it is, for Pyramus therein doth kill himself. Which, when I saw rehearsed, I must confess, made mine eyes water. But more merry tears, the passion of loud laughter never shed. Theseus, what are they that do play it? 
filament philistrate, hard-handed men that work in Athens here, which never laboured in their minds till now, and now have toiled their unbreathed memories with this same play against your nuptial. Ah, Theseus, oh, we will hear it. Philistrate, no, my noble lord, it is not for you, I have heard it over, and it is nothing, nothing in the world, unless you can find some sport in their intents, extremely stretched and conned with cruel pain to do you service. He says, I will hear that play, for never anything can be amiss when simpleness and duty do tender it. Go bring them in. Take your places, ladies. Hippolyta, Hippolyta, I love not to see wretchedness so overcharged and duty in the service perishing. Theseus, why, gentle sweet, thou shalt see no, no such thing. Hippolyta, he says they can do nothing in this kind. Theseus, Theseus, the kind of we to give them thanks for nothing. Our sport should be to take what they mistake, and what poor duty cannot do. Noble respect takes it in might, not merit. Where I have come, great clerks have proposed to to greet me with premeditated welcomes, where I have seen them shiver and look pale, make periods in the midst of sentences, throttle their practices, accent in their fears, and in conclusion dumbly have broke off not paying me a welcome. Trust me, sweet, out of this silence yet I picked a welcome, and in the modesty of fearful duty I read as much from the rattling tongue of saucy and audacious eloquence. Love, therefore, and tongue-side simplicity in least speak most to my capacity. And to philistrate. Philistrate, so please, Your Grace, the prologue is addressed. Thesis, let him approach. So here we have the setting out of the of the play, Pyramus and Thisbe, which will be performed before the Duke and uh, Hippolyta and the nobles on their wedding day at night, as uh, Bottom has told us. Um, the first lines are incredibly important here. Well, all of Shakespeare is incredibly important, but um, here Shakespeare is really talking about the craft of being a playwright. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet are imagination all compact. So he aligns himself as a poet, a writer, with a lunatic and a lover, those people who do not react by reason, but react by instinct and by emotion. Um, Theseus says, I never may believe these antique fables, these fairy toys. Well, he is part of these antique fables, and so is Hippolyta. So strange in a way that he belies his own uh, background and his own um, origin, in a way, his own genesis, uh, by decrying these antique fables, these fairy toys. But of course, um, the basis of all this is Ovid, and one of favourites, uh, one of the favourites of Shakespeare as poet. Um, per Shakespeare could read Latin, apart from what Johnson said he has little Latin and less Greek, but he really did read Latin. Um, uh, and so therefore, uh, he, he knew Ovid by heart and delved into Ovid a great deal um, for uh, inspiration, for example, Romeo and Juliet. So Pyramus and Thisbe is based on Romeo and Juliet, uh, star-crossed lovers, um, but in a far more, um, let's say, burlesque uh, way. Um, he carries on uh, with, uh, with references to his own plays, um, in line 11, Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. I think we're referring here to Cleopatra, so Antony and Cleo. The poet's eye in a fine frenzy rolling doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. Um, he's talking here about his art. The poet's pen turns them to shapes and give to airy nothing, local habitation and a name. So here he's situating his ideas, giving them substance, giving their form. If they would that that comprehend such joy, it comprehends such bringer of that joy. This is a nice epistrophe uh, here that um, explains how that we need we need a playwright to be able to enjoy the plays. Somebody has to give them some form. Somebody has to put them forward. Um, uh, Hippolyta in line twenty six echoes his word. Um, all the story of the night to, to, told over grows to something of great constancy, but howsoever strange and admirable. So here we're talking about the, the craft of being, being a playwright and the difficulties of bringing such ideas before an audience in a particular form. Then there's a little bit of banter between uh, Theseus and the lovers about um, which play should we choose. Um, he uh, runs through some other plays that are, what are, which are proposed, but Philistrate says, you know, there is a play some ten words long, we're reading from uh, line 60 here, uh, te tedious and brief, um, 
lo la tragical and merry, um, uh, and played obviously by the Mechanicals, whom both um, Philostrate and Theseus qualify as um, uh, ill-fitted for the play. But Theseus says that he will hear it because he feels that um, many people have made far more fuss about uh, a welcome than these people who are quite simple. But he says, love therefore and tongue side simplicity in least speak most to my capacity. So they're ready to um, listen to the uh, to the play. See you in a minute for the next part, part two. <laughs> 